way, welcome to week five. We've covered three of the 12 points of the classical approach to apologetics. Wow, you're like, wow, three, and we've been here week five, yeah. But tonight we're going to cover two. Isn't that exciting? So what I'd like to do, though, is I would like to talk about the ones we covered. And, uh, you know, recap is super important. I mean, over and over and over. Repetition is, is the friend to... To memory, right? Repetition, repetition, repetition. And so the first point was truth about reality is knowable. Does anyone remember? I'd like to kind of maybe hear what does that actually mean? Why is that a first point in apologetics arguments? Because are, no one's looking up at me. Everyone's looking down feverishly. They're terrified to get my eye, catch my eye. It means that truth is real and knowable, right? Truth corresponds with reality. It's not my truth, it's truth, right? Remember we talked about that? Go back over that. It's so important. You've got to be able to defend the fact that there is truth in a culture that doesn't believe in truth, right? And remember we made the jokes about asking somebody, you know, is it true that they don't believe in truth, right? So then we went to opposites cannot both be true. Now, which law did we use to talk about that? Do you remember? The law of logic, right? The laws of logic. The first law is the law of identity, which A is A. But the big one is that second one is the law of non-contradiction, which basically says this. Opposites cannot both be true. A cannot be not, a cannot be not A, right? It can't be raining and not raining. You can't be pregnant and not pregnant. Either it is or you ain't, right? So it's talking about, and the reason we use that and it's so important is when we're talking about what? other religions when people will say well all paths lead to God and you say well that's impossible logically because of the law of non-contradiction remember we built on that right we're building an argument so there is truth all right and there's only a truth there's not matter of fact the last one last one is called the law of the excluded middle it's either a or b it can't be in the middle right and so we want to use that and then we went on for two weeks and we talked about is it true that the theistic God exists? And we gave five arguments. And remember, I told you, if you can even remember to say that God is the best explanation for, what was number one? God is the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe. That's called the teleological argument, right? The first one was the cosmological argument. God is the best explanation for objective morality, right? That's called the moral argument. God is the best explanation, this is a new one, for why there's anything at all or why there's something rather than nothing, right? That's another cosmological argument. Does anyone remember who, who came up with it? Wilhelm, remember him? Yeah, the inventor, of, the inventor of calculus, right? And then the fifth one was God is the best explanation for why we have consciousness, right? We have this mind. We have this aboutness. We can know about things, right? Isn't that awesome? I enjoyed it last week. Even if you guys aren't enjoying it, I think you are. But I'm really enjoying it. I get back into it. It's like, well, this is good stuff, right? And so let's back up for a second because there was another thing that we, we, we did learn. When we talked about the cosmological argument, we learned an acronym. Do you remember in that? Surge. What does surge stand for? What's the S? The second law of thermodynamics, the U, the universe is expanding, the R, radiation afterglow, that there was an afterglow, right? The G, galaxy seeds, they actually have found through COBE, that satellite that they sent up, that there's actually remnants of the Big Bang, which is pretty amazing. And then the last one was E, Einstein's theory of relativity, which says what? Three things came into at one time. Time, space, and matter, which means God must be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial, right? Or something that created the universe, which we would say, well, there you go. Duh, it's God, right? So there you go. You guys are doing pretty good. We did that. We did talk about the fact that the universe can't be eternal. Remember that? Because it's impossible to traverse an eternal timeline, right? You would never arrive at today if the past was eternal, you would never arrive at today. It'd be like running on a treadmill and going nowhere. So, and I was like, that was more of a dark, deep philosophical argument. Then we talked about that. Uh, we we covered last week a little bit about why there's something rather than nothing, and uh, there was a there was an easy way to kind of explain that. Do you guys remember? Remember what it was? The two things we compared. 
things are either this or that. Contingent or necessary, right? Some things are necessary. That's things that exist in and of themselves, right? Like they're nothing, they're not contingent upon something that made them. We, we talked about how scientists will generally say numbers fall in that category. They're just, there are numbers. Laws, like the laws of logic that we talked about, is a contingent thing. Now, we know ultimately God is over those things as well, but they're, but they're fixed, right? They're just there. If the universe evaporated tomorrow, uh, the, the, the fact that two is two and two plus two is four and six times six is 36, it would just, would be, it's, just a tr- it's just there. It's a, it's a necessary thing. But contingent things are things that are dependent on something for their existence, right? And we talked about a few, the universe is contingent. And we went through that argument that if you found a ball, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, a glass ball, you'd say, wow, that's something must have made that. And it doesn't matter if it's the size of your car, the size of the United States, the size of the planet, or the size of the galaxy, it still is contingent on something making it. And then you build back a case with a cosmological argument to God, right? So it's good. In other words, the reason I like the contingency argument is sometimes you might forget the scientific stuff, but it's... It's fairly logical to kind of just say that things are either necessary or contingent. I mean, there's not any other options, right? Are you getting it? Okay, did you guys, uh, you guys, you guys are doing really good. If you didn't get a chance to learn these things, if you missed last week, go online and look it up, okay? All right, so tonight we're going to the next two. They both talk about the same subject. That subject is miracles. So we're going to be talking about miracles tonight. I I'll be teaching tonight primarily from Norman Geisler's book, 12 Points That Show Christianity is True, and I've added some information from other resources, but I did tell you, if you come to all of these meetings, I'm going to get you that book, for, you know, unless you missed it because you absolutely were sick or had to work or, you know, but if you just skipped it to go out to dinner, you'll have to buy it yourself. But if you can prove to me that you came here and your due diligence, I'm going to get you that book, okay? Just because you, you've been faithful. And I may even just be generous enough to get some more books. I'll be teaching tonight primarily from that book, though, okay? So here it is, point four of the classical approach. If you're going in order, it is miracles are possible. Miracles are possible. So again, we have a syllogism to memorize. Oh, we didn't even go through all our syllogisms earlier. We should have. We'll go over those next week, okay? We're going to go over each of the syllogisms that we've learned. But a syllogism is whenever you have a premise and it's true, the second premise is true. If all of those are true, the conclusion becomes true. And so here it is. If a theistic God exists, then miracles are possible. The theistic God created the universe, which is the biggest miracle of all. That's point two. Therefore, this is the conclusion, miracles are possible and other supernatural acts also, also occur. So the miracle of creation right? The foundation of all miracles. What I'm basically saying, and this, I'm going to spend some time on this, but I could really, this is one of the easiest points to convey to people. Because I'll just tell you up front, the real simple answer is if somebody says, I don't believe in miracles, what they're really saying is, I don't believe in God. They're not saying they don't believe in miracles, because miracles are a given if there's a God. That's the point. That's, we're going to spend time on unpacking that, but that's the simple answer, okay? So the miracle of creation. So if God created the universe, the biggest miracle, the creation of something from nothing, remember, no thing is what? No thing, right? So, you know, the universe from nothing, the book that was published a few years ago, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So the creation of something from nothing had to be done by someone. So it has already taken place. The creation of the universe is the most significant miracle because God brought everything into existence from nothing. But he was the catalyst. He is the thing. But to say that there was no catalyst, there was no necessary agent, is impossible. Because something can't create itself. And it's just illogical, right? And so God brought everything into existence from nothing. Once we accept that, Other miracles like turning water into wine, raising the dead, they become entirely possible. So when somebody comes to you and they say they're struggling with the belief in miracles, and this is how it usually comes across. You get it in a conversation with your cousin or your aunt, 
aunt, your aunt, uh, aunt Anne, or whoever your aunt is, Aunt Betty, and she says to you over turkey dinner, she says, you know, I just have a hard time with that whole Noah's Ark thing. You know, or or I have a hard time with the, the splitting of the Red Sea. There's a real hard, there's a miracle, right? The split, Noah's Ark, maybe that's not really a miraculous thing, although he did miraculously keep them. But it, it, the splitting of the Red Sea, where they walk through on dry ground, that that's a miracle. And you know, I can I can buy into the love your neighbor as yourself. I can get the the stories of you know the the. the but to say that those things really happen, Jesus walked on water. So this is when you would bring these arguments in that you would go back to, is there a God? And then you'd argue from that. If there's a God, then of course he could walk on water. Of course he could, if he can create the whole universe from nothing, then he could do those things, right? So the foundation of any belief in miracles starts with that belief in God. When someone says they don't believe, go to that argument. Miracles are supernatural. They're a supernatural act. They're not just unusual events. They're supernatural interventions by God into our world. They don't violate the laws of nature. They override them. Because miracles are rare, though. I want to say this. Sometimes when you look at the Bible, especially the book of Acts, and you go from page to page, you're like, man, that's like the apostles were just doing miracles every day. But what we don't, we don't think about is that sometimes you turn the page and it's eight years later. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, Paul goes for many years into Damascus, or we just think it's just happening, man. It's just, they're, just, they're just doing miracles after miracles, and why don't those happen today? Well, that's not a good. And so you can use that in talking to someone about miracles, that they are actually rare, but they do happen, okay? They, they don't violate the laws of nature. They override them, turning water into wine, healing the blind, raising the dead. These are examples of God stepping in directly, The word miracle comes from a Latin word. It's miraculum. And it is derived from another word, mirari, which means to wonder or to be amazed. So basically breaking it down, the word is broke down to wonder or to marvel. And then culum is a suffix, which means an instrument or a means of. So a miracle literally means an event that causes wonder or amazement. And so God isn't into parlor tricks, folks. When he does a miracle, it is 100% to show who he is for his glory. It's to bring people glory to God, not for people. That's why when Simon in the the book of Acts tried to buy the power, he he turned around and they cursed him, right? Because he's like, don't do that. Much worse is going to happen to you if you do that kind of thing, right? So a miracle literally means an event that causes wonder or amazement. And that's what God's interested in. He's not interested in just doing something to do something. Matter of fact, he even said multiple times in Jesus' ministry, this, this evil, adulterous generation seeks a sign. You're wanting me to just do miracles. But that's not why they're done. They're done that you might come to know him. That's the point. And the message of who Jesus is, the message of the cross, the message of, of salvation. And so in a theological context, this refers to a supernatural event that inspires awe because it goes beyond the natural order, typically seen as an act of God. So what about supernatural? The word supernatural, kind of, if you understand miracles and supernatural, you want to put them together. It can be broken down to two words, super, which comes from a Latin word, which means above or beyond, super, coming from above, and natural refers to the physical world, the normal laws of nature. So when God does something supernatural, he does it not by nature, he does it outside of nature, above nature. He intervenes and does things that normally don't happen, like making an axe head float. God is above nature. He is above nature. He is. He's, a, he's what's called transcendent. He sits above everything, but he's also imminent. He's with us. He's, he's, the Bible calls him uh, Emmanuel, God with us. So he's both the God out there and the God who's present. Why? Because he's omnipresent. And so supernatural above and beyond um, the natural world. And so you want to keep these thoughts in mind when you think about these things. 
So distinguishing the supernatural from the unusual. Sometimes things are just unusual, right? Matter of fact, just this week, we had some really unusual. I saw some this morning as I looked at Facebook, some of my friends posted some very unusual pictures. One was called the Northern Lights, the Aurora, Bore, Aurora Borealis. It showed up this last, last couple of days in places that it hasn't been lately, like in, in Michigan, where I'm from. A bunch of people posted pictures of it because we're having solar flares that are hitting the Earth. Now, here's the thing about the Aurora Borealis. It's now explained by charged particles from the sun interacting with the Earth's magnetic fields. The auroras were once mysterious and they were considered supernatural by ancient cultures because they're beautiful and their color. But when science understood where they came from, now we know they're just an anomaly, right? They don't happen all the time. They only happen certain seasons. They only happen when the sun gives off those things. But these aren't necessarily supernatural. Then you have things, uh, to kind of another distinguishing thing between supernatural and unusual. You have psychosomatic events. So our minds are powerful, you know. I'm, I mean, God, golly, that to me it's a miracle already. But the fact that our minds can do the amazing things that they can do, that our bodies can heal. I mean, I don't know if you just sit and think about it, but when you get a cut, like, if you take care of it, it's going to heal up. I mean, we just take that for granted because ever since we were, you know, falling over, it's just always happened. Broken bones, men, things. You're just like, this is pretty amazing. But it's the same with our minds. There's actually some pretty powerful things in our minds. Have you ever heard of the placebo effect, right? So someone can take a sugar tablet and be told they're given medicine and they can get better. And you're like, how in the world? Because we, you know what? I could pause here for a second. I think I will. And tell you that tells you the power of positive thinking, right? Whatsoever things are good, holy, right, just, excellent, praiseworthy, think on these things. If you start just constantly speaking and determining negative things, you can have negative impacts because we, the mind is part of this amazing body. But psychosomatic events are not supernatural. God's still using natural things in your body to do those miracles at times. So sometimes it is just that. Then we have providential occurrences. Sometimes natural events happen at just the right time, like fog helping Washington's armies escape when they were being attacked by the British. God's hand is in these, but it's not always miraculous. Sometimes he providentially moves things or allows nature to do something different. He could, he could divert a storm, right? But he's not necessarily going supernatural. He's not necessarily going above that because he's God and he's just moving things around, right? And he can do that. But when he starts suspending things or creating things or going above the idea of walking through a wall that's locked in John chapter 20 and showing up among the disciples and they go, wow, you know, and saying, you know, peace. That is a supernatural event. So we have providential things. We have anomalies. We have psychosomatic events. We also have magic tricks, right? That's what Simon the Sorcerer really was. I mean, he was just a magician. But just because someone can do some magic tricks, that's not miracles. That's just sleight of hand or tricks or just an illusion, absolutely. Sleight of hands can, can deceive us into thinking something miraculous happened. Matter of fact, I know for a long time when I was young, I'd see David Blaine. I said, that guy's demonic. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, he's just, I mean, he might be, but I mean, he's, he's just genuinely doing illusions. He's just really good at it, right? So real miracles have God's fingerprints all over them. They're the kinds of things that, and this is the important part, only God can do. That's how we know a miracle. It's something that cannot be replicated, okay? Now, someone may be thinking right now that, well, it seems to me that in the, in the book of um, Exodus that we see these magicians mimicking the plagues, but they weren't. They were simply mimicked them. They were not doing the supernatural. They were not. They looked similar. It was parlor tricks for them, right? So only God can do those things like creating life, raising the dead, instantaneous healings. I've, how many have seen bona fide real miracles? Now, sometimes we call things miracles that, in a sense, all of life is a miracle. But that's not how we want to define these things when we're talking in apologetics terms because we got to be able to say the same thing that the person who's def defending that there's, or, or, or arguing that there aren't miracles, we've got to use the same language. So if I say, well, I woke up today, that was a miracle. Not really. I mean, it's a miracle in the sense that all of life is a miracle, but it's just part of life and the natural processes, right? 
outside of that. So, so sometimes Christians get bogged down in saying, isn't God so awesome? He's so miraculous. Well, he is all the time because everything's held together by God, but we don't kind of get confused in the terminologies. Does that make sense? And so I remember when I was in the Ukraine, I went to the Ukraine uh, in college before all this mess that they're in now. It was right after the Soviet Union came down, and I saw a kid who was born blind get healed of blindness, and he was 11 years old. Tremendous miracle. I saw a guy who was in that same crusade who had a World War II, he was a World War II vet, and he had been hunched over with um, kyphosis, and he stood up and began to praise God and run around the room. That's miraculous. Because that is going beyond, that's accelerating the process of healing, <laughs> right? To a, in a supernatural way right now. <laughs> the kid who didn't have sight, and that's what Jesus would do. He would, he would go and he would do miracles to show his love, to reveal himself to the world. And so what are the characteristics of biblical miracles? Biblical miracles have key features, the first one is that they are always un, un, they're unusual in nature. So they're, they're out of the ordinary. Like walking on water is not something. That's why they were so amazed at it. That's why when he called Lazarus forth, they immediately decided they wanted to kill even Lazarus. <laughs> you know? It's like pretty bad when you get raised from the dead and then they want to just put you right back in, right? But, but because of the fact that those supernatural out of the ordinary things happen and they're so unusual there's no other way to explain it at the time the pharisees didn't like the message of jesus and so they were trying to they really didn't like what he was standing for because they liked their own power their own place and so they they wanted to get rid of him for the different reasons it's not that they didn't believe they were miracles they didn't like the ramifications of the miracles another characteristic of biblical miracles is there's a theological dimension you say, of course there is, right? Miracles assume God's involvement. God is involved in a miracle. You cannot have a miracle without God. Okay? Just so you know. If it's a miracle, God is in it. Every time. There is no miracle without God. I want you to put that in your bank. It sounds really simple, but it's very important. Okay? Because... Theism, the belief in God, asserts that God can and does intervene. I didn't talk about this a couple weeks ago, and I was supposed to, um, and it's important, but there's, there's, a, there's another belief system called deism. I was going to touch on it, and I didn't. It was in my notes. For some reason, I skipped it. Rhonda loves that. But deism is the belief that God did start everything, much like a person would wind up a clock, or create a clock and wind it up and then put it on a shelf and then leave it. In other words, God did start everything, but then he removed himself from it. But that is not theism that we believe in because we know that Jesus tells us that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. The Bible tells us God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible tells us that God is, is Emmanuel, God with us. The Bible tells us he's involved in his creation. He's always here the psalmist says, if no matter where I go, I can't escape your presence. And so God is an involved God, and that's very important. So the moral purpose uh, in reflecting on miracles is to let us know that God is moving. He is present. If you see a miracle, not that God isn't always present. He's always present. We know he, we can't go anywhere. He's not. But he is actively present when he's doing a miracle. So then there's a moral principle Miracles reflect God's goodness, and I want you to get this. Because of the fact that he takes time to interact with people who reject him, who deny him, who oppose him, who do everything but follow him, and he cares enough to continually show up and show himself to be who he is, a caring, a loving, a kind, a good God. The purpose of a miracle like this kid being healed of blindness is solely that they might know there's a God who's loving and kind and cares about them. That was the purpose, right? And so there's a moral purpose. They always glorify God. If somebody else is trying to take credit for it, if somebody else gets credit for it, this is, this is not the purpose. The purpose is to reveal that he's present, to reveal that he's good, and to bring him glory and draw us close to him. Because ultimately God's plan is for our salvation, everyone and our continued 
relationship with him. That's it. That's what we're here for. Everything else is gravy, you know, your spouse, your house, all the stuff you have. Even if you have a mouse, I thought I'd throw another rhyme in there. So the moral principle is for the goodness and the glory of God to be revealed. So what about the doctrinal connection? And I'm going to really talk about this in the next point. But miracles are often tied to truth claims. And we're going to come back to that. And then, and then finally, the uh, last characteristic I want to talk about of biblical miracles is that they are purposeful. Unlike magic or entertainment, miracles serve a purpose. Always. There's always so you always want to ask the question or, or answer the question. Is God present? Yes, he is. Is he loving? Yes, look what he's doing. Is, he, is there a purpose in this? Yes, there is. That's why it's not happening all the time. It's purposeful. It's intentional. It's t- to make a point. It's God showing up. It's God showing off. And so unlike magic or entertainment, always a purpose, like revealing God's power to bring people to faith. So there are objections to this. The first objection, I want to talk about some of them. There's a lot more, but I thought I'd throw some out there because you're going to hear objections while you're talking about this thing. When someone, when Aunt Nancy asks you about how in the world did, did G- Jesus turn water into wine, and you say, well, if he created the universe, yada, yada, yada. Here's some though, ready? Miracles violate the laws of nature, people will say. So wait a second. Skeptics like David Hume argue that miracles violate the laws of nature, and since natural laws are unchangeable, Miracles are impossible. And we would say that. We would say natural laws are unchangeable, but not unchangeable to God, right? This argument assumes that natural laws are absolute and cannot be overridden. But if God created the universe and he established those laws, then he can choose to intervene when he wishes. Okay, we can't. We can't subvert the laws. No matter how much you desire, and I said this the first week or second week, if you stand on the building, the top of the roof, and say, I don't believe in gravity, it doesn't matter. Your belief doesn't create truth. But God could say that. He could say, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I decide I'm, I'm going to override gravity, and he can walk off, and he'd be perfectly fine. We know that because what? When he was before the disciples, he went up before them into the clouds, defying gravity, a miracle, by the way, right? And so when someone says that, if the answer is if God created the universe and established those laws, he can intervene. Miracles don't violate natural laws. They show God's power over them. Remember, supernatural. And that's how you'd explain it. You'd say, well, that's why they're called supernatural. Super means above. And guess who's above? <laughs> right? That's just a simplified, right? Oversimplified. So the creation of the universe from nothing was a violation of natural law, but it happened. The natural law says you can't get something from nothing. It's a law of causation, right? But God can because he's the uncaused cause. Remember we talked about that? That's why when somebody says to you, who caused God? You say, nobody. He's always been. He is. He's what? We learned it last week. What's it called? Tess, what's it called? God's always been. Nothing. Nothing made him. What does that mean? He's necessary, right? Okay, let's go to another objection. There's no evidence for miracles. Some claim there's no reliable evidence for miracles and that past experiences always point to natural causes. Now, this objection ignores ignores historical evidence for miracles. And this is going to be one of our later points, but the, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical evidence of a miracle. It's been documented by eyewitnesses, supported by historical records. Further, singular events like the creation of the universe, and that one we would argue with a cosmological argument, um, the origins of life, they are miraculous. And so these events are not repeated, yet scientists believe they happen based on the, evi- sorry, based on the evidence. Why should we treat biblical miracles differently? So that's what you how you would build a case. You would talk about the cosmological argument. You talk about, well, if, if that could have happened. And certainly, we could have other miracles, right? And then, and then getting into the arguments for Jesus and the resurrection will be a whole week. We'll just talk about all that stuff, you know? So let's move on to another one, another objection. Unusual events can be explained by science. 
Skeptics often say that what we call miracles can be explained by natural causes that we yet don't, don't yet understand. I want you to tell you, I'm going to tell you what this is, what I call this and some people call it. Have you ever heard of the God of the gaps theory? The God of the gaps says that, um, that we put God into areas when there was a gap that we didn't understand. Like we used to think that God made lightning until we understood lightning came from somewhere else and then we removed God out of that gap and we said, well, it's science and da-da-da. And so that's what they say. So they try to argue that, you know, God of the gaps is just that you guys postulate that it's all this God, 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 but science is slowly eroding that all away. But actually it's the opposite. I, I, I say this argument right here, unusual events can be explained by science. It's the science of the gaps. Because what they're saying is we're going to believe science uh, we're going to keep believing science until, yeah, until it's proven. <laughs> well, that doesn't make any sense, right? You're just going to, by faith, believe science, scientific evidence for something. It's, let me give you an example of the science of the gaps. The multiverse. People are like, there are, there's multiple universes. We've never seen them. We've never measured them. We, there's no evidence for them. There's zero evidence that they exist, and yet they believe possibly because of string theories that they might exist. So someone postulated that. That's called the science of the gaps. They're going to believe that until otherwise. Well, that's crazy, right? Science can explain many unusual events. True miracles like the resurrection of Jesus or turning water into wine go beyond natural explanations. They're not just rare occurrences. Remember, they are super natural interventions that defy natural explanations. And so there, you'll never find a natural explanation for a miracle. You can't. If you say Jesus turned water into wine and all these eyewitnesses saw it, you can't tell me how that would have happened as a, in scientifically, right? Natural events don't happen immediately. Like my person, my, my person I mentioned being miraculously healed at the moment someone prayed for him, Right? or the guy with kyphosis, or, or God just immediately walking on water, or Peter stepping out of the boat, or, I mean, we can go on and on through miracles, right? You guys with me? Miracles are possible. That's a point. You want to learn it, because a lot of people will come. It's not, it's usually more subtle, but they'll get to talking about the Bible. I can't believe the Bible, because yada, 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 some of the miracles. And then you can argue for the Bible and for truth and for based on if the cosmological argument if God created all things, then certainly he could suspend natural sciences and supernaturally do things beyond. Are you with me? Got it? All right, let's move on. Slide 10. This is the next one. Oh, actually, I have one more objection. Do I have one more objection? Oh, let me do that. If miracles were real, they would... This is my wife's not here to give me a dirty eye. If miracles were real, they would happen all the time. Some say that if miracles were real, they'd happen all the time, not just in ancient times. So miracles are, the, by defined definition, rare. They wouldn't be miraculous if it was happening all the time, right? It would just be natural. <laughs> like, like we, then you could probably postulate the science of the gaps. If zebras were just showing up everywhere, right? It's out of nowhere. Just things were just, I don't know why I keep choosing zebras, but if zebras were just showing up miraculously, choo, 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 zebras everywhere, zebras in my house, zebras in the car, you'd have to say, this must be some scientific phenomenon because it's just continually happening everywhere around the planet. Now, God could do something like that, but what I'm saying is miracles, by definition, usually show up at they're one-off. They're, they're, they're for the purpose of God's glory, his honor, drawing people to him, his goodness. Remember, it's those things. And so they're def, by definition, they're rare. You can answer them. You know, revealing God's power, confirming his message. And you can tell them that. You can say the reason God did them is he wants us to know him. Explain that to them. They're not meant to be everyday occurrences. Just because something doesn't happen frequently doesn't mean it never happens, right? The creation of the universe, the origin of life happened only one time. So someone might argue and they say, well, you know, I haven't seen anybody else walk on water. That doesn't mean it's not true. If anything, that just shows me how much of a miracle it was that Jesus himself did it only, right? Although we do have Peter for a short time. So here's the conclusion before I, I jumped ahead. But the conclusion, if God exists and miracles are, are um, 
if God exists, then miracles are not, poss- are not only possible, but expected, right? They're expected. The biggest miracle of all creation has already taken place. If God can create the universe from nothing, turning water into wine, raising the dead is no problem. Objections to mirac- uh, the miraculous often assume that natural laws are absolute or there's no evidence, but both assumptions are flawed. God who created everything can and does intervene. Isn't that awesome? The fact that there's miracles just shows us how loving he is. You know, now we're going to move forward. Hey, now Pat says yes. So we're moving to the fifth point. This is the fifth point of the classical approach. So you guys got four down, right? Isn't that great? Miracles can serve as divine confirmation of a truth claim. Now, this can be phrased a little differently. Some of these can, but if you can just basically get the gist of this, miracles can serve as divine confirmation of a truth claim. So here's the syllogism. If a theistic God exists, miracles are possible. We already established that, by the way. Premise two, miracles performed in connection with a truth claim can confirm that the message is from God. Conclusion, therefore, miracles can be used to confirm God's truth through a messenger. Now, you're like, why are we focusing on this? It's important because we're building a case for Jesus being who he said he was and being God, okay? You're building a case. And so people likely aren't going to come up to you with this argument. But you want to understand it so you can argue from it. That they, The purpose of miracles is, uh, they, or they, one of the big reasons that God gives us miracles is they serve to confirm um, a truth claim. So let's talk more about miracles. Miracles are acts of divine confirmation. Since we've already established that a theistic God exists and miracles are possible, we now need to look at what purpose they serve. Remember, not parlor tricks, right? Miracles are not just random events. They are God's actions to confirm a truth claim. What are they to confirm? A truth claim. What are they to confirm? A truth claim. I just want to know you're with me. What are they to confirm? Yes, absolutely. So the primary purpose of a miracle is to show that God is behind the message. That's why Jesus showed up and signs and wonders accompanied his teachings. He wasn't just another zealot. There were lots of zealots claiming to be the Messiah at that time. He taught as one who is approved of God. He taught as a, in a miraculous way. But on top of that, he did miracles to confirm who he was. He did that, right? to show that what he was saying was authentic. And so in the Old Testament, when God sent Moses to deliver Israel from Egypt, he confirmed Moses' authority with miracles, right? Remember? Over and over and over. And every time he got stiff-necked and decided not to do it, and he came for it with another one. Let my people go. I have, I, I, the, the truth is there's a God. His name is Yahweh. You know, he came... He sent me here. He has a plan for his people, blah, 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 blah. Let them go. This is not his plan. He's real. I don't know if I believe all that stuff. You know, you're going to get frogs, gnats, you know, what all the things, right? So the miracles confirmed the truth claim. He didn't, he wasn't interested in just doing things, right? The same pattern holds in Christianity where Jesus' miracles confirmed his claim to be not just another zealot, but the son of God. His resurrection from the dead is the ultimate miracle confirming his divine nature. It's what Paul says, if he had not risen from the dead, we're wasting our time. Our faith is futile without the resurrection. But the resurrection, the ultimate, for someone to raise themselves from death is the ultimate miracle, right? The primary purpose of miracles in Christianity, in the Gospels, miracles constantly serve as proof of Jesus. When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said this, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus was admitting it. He was a Pharisee. He was scared, though, of his buddies who he thought was going to rat him out or get, you know, get him in trouble. And he might have the wrath of the, the Pharisees in Sanhedrin. So he came at night. But what does he say? No one can do these signs unless God's with him. These signs attest to the truth of who you are and what you're saying. You with me? We're looking at scriptures tonight. When he healed the paralytic in Mark 2, Jesus said, 
that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and then he performed the miracle. I'm doing this that you may know a truth claim, that I have authority. So the sign accompanied the truth claim. Are you with me? You guys amping? The apostles also performed miracles to confirm their message of Jesus. This is why Jesus said, greater things are you going to do. And then they began to do them. It wasn't because people wanted to say, man, these guys were really awesome. They must have been with Jesus. Isn't that cool? No, because they were preaching the message of the truth of who Jesus was and doing miracles to show that he was with them, that he was present, that he was doing uh, things that would punctuate the message of preaching the gospel. And today still does that, folks. Still does it. How many believe miracles still happen? Right. My son's calling me, but I'm not going to get that. Okay. The apostles performed miracles to confirm their message after Jesus ascended into heaven. Peter at Pentecost, his first message, told the crowd that Jesus was accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. He uses that phrase. In other words, you can know that he was real because of these things. It's his preaching. In fact, the miracles performed by the apostles were meant to confirm their teaching. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it emphasizes God uh, testified to the truth of the gospel. It says, by signs, wonders, and various miracles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's a famous verse, uh, chapter for people who are charismatic or Pentecostal like we are, folks. It talks about nine supernatural, charismatic gifts of the Spirit. Three knowing gifts, three speaking gifts, and three doing gifts. All of them given to the church to accomplish. Why? Because of the truth claims of Jesus. When they show up, they give evidence to the truth claims of God. What are they? You guys missed my Holy Spirit class, some of you. If you did miss, you can, we're going to do it next year again. I'd like you to come to it. It's a good class, okay? So... Word of wisdom and word of knowledge, for example. This is when somebody supernaturally knows something, a word of knowledge, that they would not conventionally know. For example, if I all of a sudden know, I was, at a, I was one time um, ministering at Winterfest in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and uh, there was a kid who was on the front row, and the Lord showed me that he was being abused, clearly. And I was even afraid to say it when I stepped out to tell him about that abuse, he was blown away by it, and it punctuated the message that this guy had just preached was real, Christianity was real, and this man is a, a man of God, and God really does love him and care for him. The message was coming across that there's a God who cares about you and transcends your struggle, right? That's a word of knowledge. Word of wisdom is when you don't know what to do, you're in a supernatural quandary, and God's supernatural, not conventional wisdom, but beyond the regular wisdom gives you supernatural understanding of how to do something, right? So when these happen, words of wisdom and words of knowledge, they're not just good advice or knowledge gained through study, but they're direct insight from God into situations and circumstances. We have another gift in that same chapter, the gift of faith. In this context, it's not talking about ordinary faith. All of us have faith, but sometimes extraordinary faith is given by a manifestation of the Spirit for a specific circumstance so you can do what you would not have the faith to do otherwise. I remember reading about a man in Africa who in the midst of preaching a crusade, a lion came out of the, out of the jungle and began to start attacking people. And the guy got this supernatural gift of faith and walked up to the lion and then he rebuked the lion and lightning struck the lion. So there was a couple things happening there. He had the gift of faith because uh, I'd be scared to go into a lion. But he also had a miracle take place. And, of course, the message then was believed by everyone because miracles punctuate truth claims. People were like, this, we're going to listen to what this fellow's saying. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay. Healing and miracles, and miracles, the gift of miracles in that chapter is talking about every other miracle. There's a lot of categories of miracles, but it's mentioned as a gift, and it's one of the gifts we should pray for. But healing um, is also, uh, sounds like a miracle, so, but when it mentions and differentiates in that chapter between healing and miracles, he's talking about other miracles outside of healing, but they speak for themselves, supernatural acts, right? Then you have prophecy, uh, discerning of spirits, the gift of tongues, uh, interpretation of tongues. These are all manifestations of God's supernatural communication where he's actually talking to somebody. 
Talk about confirming a message. He's not just confirming it, he's giving it. And it's being confirmed by our spirit in the reception, especially when God prophetically says something that, that takes place and then people are like, oh, wow. He must be real. This must be true. This Christianity stuff is pretty authentic, right? Are you with me? So these gifts show that the church continues to be a place where miracles happen. Healing the sick, delivering prophetic messages, working miracles are part of how God confirms his power and presence through his people. So when we talk about miracles today, it's not just something from the biblical times. God still gives those gifts to the church to show his hand in his work and to confirm the truth claims of who he is and the word of God, okay? While God can and does perform miracles through his people, it's important to remember, and this is a foot stomp, I want you to get this. While God does perform miracles through his people, when he does a miracle, it's not God putting a stamp of approval on the person. The focus is on the message, not the messenger. How do I know that? Well, there's biblical examples. Remember heard of the guy named Balaam in the Bible? Balaam was a rascal, but God used him to prophesy. Jonah ran in the opposite way, not wanting to follow God, but God used him. So it's not approval of the person, but it is approval of the message, okay? The message is what it's about. The miracle is the message. And the reason I say that even happened to me when I was pastoring in Watertown, New York, I had a guy who was being used miraculously a lot in our church. But his character was a little off. <laughs> Matter of fact, he would, he would maybe not show up at church for a while, show up and all of a sudden God would use him. And people would say, that can't be from God because we know that guy, I won't say his name, but he's not living a, well, again, God wasn't putting a stamp of approval on him. God just used a vessel who happened to be usable at that time. Does that make sense? So don't get distracted by who it's coming through. It's the, it's the message that God is with us and the message that the truth claims of who he is are true, right? Okay? The same applies to the charismatic gifts. All those gifts I just mentioned, people can do it. I've seen them. I've seen people not show up at church forever and ever and ever, show up, give a word of tongue interpretation, and people are like, how's she doing that? She was just a vessel, just like Balaam. Not ba oh, Balaam. Yeah, Balaam, yeah. I was thinking of Balaam's donkey for a minute. So that's why it's so important to discern the message that accompanies the miracle. That's the thing of this whole point. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, these gifts are given to build up the church and to reveal God's will, but they don't guarantee that the person using the gift is perfect or immune. So miracles in other religions, even Islam, there is a recognition that miracles can confirm a truth claim. And I'm not saying Islam is, is, Islam is false, but within Islam, they recognize Jesus as a miracle worker. They recognize Moses. They talk about Moses because it's part of their teaching, right? But, I mean, they did it for the same thing. They're trying to bring truth claims to their faith. But we know that, do you know, this is just a fry, free candy, a fry bonbon. But do you know that, that uh, Muhammad in, in the Islamic religion, he never did a miracle? They say he's the greatest prophet, even greater than Jesus, and Jesus is doing miracles everywhere and gets risen from the dead, and yet Muhammad, who never even did a miracle, is greater than Jesus. I mean, that's, that's a sidebar. So, so here's some objections and responses from skeptics. Miracles can be faked or misunderstood. People will say that. Some skeptics argue that what we call miracles could be misunderstandings of natural events or tricks like a magician's illusion. It's true that, that not everything unusual, and I said this earlier, is a miracle, but true miracles bear unmistakable fingerprints, right? It's unmistakable when it happens. You can try to answer it away, but when you really look at the evidence, walking on water is unmistakably a miracle. It's not, well, the wind was blowing just right, and he just happened to hydrofoil across the water, you know? For example... Raising someone from the dead or being healed of instant blindness are not things that can be faked or misunderstood, right? So that's what I would say to that. Another objection, miracles only happen in religious texts. We, why don't we see them today? You know what? Unfortunately, people even in the body of Christ are saying this. And the reason we don't see them today is, is <laughs> truth is for me talking to you folks, is you got to believe, right? You have not because you ask not. Jesus, what does it say? What did Paul say? 
He said, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, right? He tells us we're supposed to be desiring them. We should covet them and not literally like the sin of covetous, but desire them so much that we would want them, right? And so when someone says miracles only happen in religious texts, why don't we see them? Some skeptics point out that we don't see, uh, we don't seem to witness miracles today like in the Bible. Miracles are by definition rare. Remember that. They're rare. They're not happening every day. They are happening, but they're not happening every day. And they certainly are, are happening a lot less in a skeptical, westernized culture that puts science above all things and doesn't believe for God and runs for an aspirin before they run for prayer and runs for this or for that. And I'm not downing that, but I'm saying we live in a culture that goes after the natural things often than the supernatural. But when you're in a poor country where you have to rely on it because you don't have money, you don't have means, you need a miracle, you need God to show up, you see him a lot more frequently. Does that make sense? So miracles are rare by definition. Additionally, historical records of miracles like the resurrection of Jesus provide strong evidence. Again, you can go there. And I keep saying that. People will say, wait a second, you keep saying historical records of the resurrection. The Bible is a historical record, folks. People want to put it in some weird category, but it's historical eyewitness testimony. The first four Gospels, four different narratives of an event that took place written by four separate people, complete different books, not one book, 66 books. These are four different books written about an event, just like if we went to a, a car crash and four people wrote down what they saw, okay? Trust me, if you went to a court of law and you had corroborating evidence, 500 people saw Jesus rise from the dead, right? If you had 500 people get up on a stand and say, yeah, he shot the guy. Yeah, he shot him. That, that guy right there shot him. Hey, that, guy, that guy's going to jail. Am I right? Let's move on. Why believe in miracles when science explains everything? That's that science of the gaps. Another common objection is that science has advanced to the point where we don't need to believe in miracles since most things have natural explanations. You know, science does an, ex science does an excellent job of explaining natural processes, but it does not explain everything, <laughs> especially supernatural events, because by nature they can't be measured naturally. Because they're supernatural, right? You guys, are you catching it? They don't contradict science, but rather show God's ability to intervene in a natural world. In fact, the biggest miracle of all, the creation of the universe, is something even science points to as having a beginning. Let's look at slide 18, and we're going to land the plane here. If miracles confirm a religion... Why do different religions claim miracles? Skeptics like David Hume argue that if different religions claim miracles, it would, would cancel out their credibility. Not all miracle claims are equal, folks. Just because someone says it's a miracle doesn't mean it's a miracle. Some of those things you're seeing, all those things you're seeing from false religions are not miracles. They're, they are parlor tricks. Or they are the devil showing up and doing something that's a pseudo-miracle. But he's not, he's not, he's not supernatural because he's not God. He can't go above nature, but he can make things look like that. He's a deceiver. The Bible says he, he, he's crafty. He walks around like a roaring lion, seeking who he might devour. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy people's lives. And so he can make things look like that, just like the magicians, right? They have a clear divine purpose, miracles do, and they confirm a specific truth claim. In Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus is a one-of-a-kind miracle, right? You want to come back to that. So they directly confirm his claim to be God, and no other religious figure makes that bold of a claim. Nobody claims their leader is God and has risen from the dead. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Confucius, not, it just doesn't happen, okay? So here's the conclusion. Miracles serve as divine confirmation of a truth claim. If God exists and miracles are possible, then it makes sense that God would use supernatural acts to show us what's true. The miracles performed by Jesus and his apostles are not just stories. They're evidence that God was working through them to reveal his truth. These miracles confirm the message. Matter of fact, I think John writes in the back of his book, these things have been written that you might believe. He testifies to the miracles that you might believe. Believe what? The truth claims. I was an eyewitness. I saw them. All these people were eyewitnesses. The book of Acts, all eyewitnesses saw these miracles, were part of these miracles that you might believe always. These miracles confirm the message that Jesus is God in the flesh, that everything he taught is true. Skeptical objections either misunderstood 
the, misunderstand the purpose of miracles or assume that natural events can explain everything. But the evidence for true miracles shows they are acts of God confirming his truth to us. Okay? You guys with me? So tonight may not have been as exciting as last week, but it's laying a foundation. We want to lay a foundation. Maybe it was as exciting. I, it might be exciting. I like talking about miracles, all right? And so here's your notes, guys. And we're going to close in prayer, okay? Thank you for coming out. We're building a case for Christ, right? And it's going to be steps. Case for who Jesus is. A, a classical apologetic approach, right? Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for the miraculous. Jesus, God, you're a God who is above all things, Lord God, and yet you're with us, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you are genuinely interested in your people. We thank you, Father God, that you care about us and that you love us, Lord God, with an unconditional love, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you'll do whatever it takes to reach us, Lord. I pray for you to begin to move more and more miraculously in this church. I pray for the gifts of the Spirit to begin to flow. I pray for prophecy and healing, divine interventions of words of knowledge and words of wisdom, Lord God, discernment of spirits for miracles and tongues and interpretation for faith, Lord God. I pray that you'd begin to move and people would get hungry for that, Lord God. I pray, Father, that, Lord, we would be people who bring the message of God accompanied with the miraculous, Lord. But we thank you for the miracles that you do. We thank you for the miracles you've done. We thank you for the resurrection, God, that you are God Almighty and you love us enough to die knowing that you would conquer death's death and, and hell, Father God, in the grave for us. We bless you, Lord. We worship you. We thank you for gathering us together tonight. In Jesus' name. And the church said what? Amen. Amen.